Hi, and welcome to On Point. I'm Mandy Gosling. Today we'll be discussing the feminist movements in the Middle East and how the recent political changes there may impact the lives of women. My guests today are Dr. Nayere Tohidi of the Department of Gender and Women's Studies here at Cal State Northridge and a research associate at the Center for Near Eastern Studies of UCLA. As well, Fatma Durak, who is the president of the Cal State Northridge Turkish American Students Association and a graduate student studying sociology and social movements in the Middle East. Thank you both for being here today. That's my pleasure. Uh, in the news recently, we've been seeing lots of images of, of the protests that are happening in Egypt, in Tunisia, and a lot of those images have women in them. And it's different compared to what I think a lot of us in the West perceive Middle Eastern women to be active in. And I wondered if you could speak to the role of women in the protests that are happening in the Middle East right now. Yes, uh, there has been so many stereotypes and simplistic ideas about Middle Eastern women, you know, as if uh, they are all monolithic, homogeneous uh, body, which is not true. And also some of the stereotypes uh, entailed <coughs> about like passivity, submissiveness, ignorance, illiteracy, uh, lack of participation in the public life and all that. Fortunately, the new images that we are seeing now that this, uh, these revolutionary movements are going on, many people are learning that, uh, oh, no, those simplistic assumptions are not true. Women are actually very active. They are in the forefront of many of these movements, especially in Tunisia and in Egypt. Women of all walks of lives, uh, women who were covered, some uh, extremely, as far as I'm concerned, some very uh, you know, stylish and Western type of clothing. Um, so all sorts of women, young, old, uh, participated in these movements. So I think um, this is kind of a teaching moment and also humbling moment for many of us who thought uh, Arabs uh, don't like democracy, or there is kind of an uh, Arab excep exceptionalism, or Muslims, uh, the, or Islamic uh, tradition is not compatible with democracy, with women's activism. So I think uh, people in different uh, parts of the Middle East and North Africa are proving us wrong, or at least those of us who, who were uh, thinking so simplistically about them. Um, and Fatma, as a young Middle Eastern woman, do you, how does it feel to see young people so well represented, and young women specifically represented in, in these protests? Yeah, you know, as you know, I just born and raised in Turkey, and I have been in the States for about like three and a half years, so I'm just, um, I have the like totally Middle Eastern perspective, young Middle Eastern perspective, which I just heritage from Turkey. And I just want to start a really, really short story. When I just came to the States, all my friends out asking, you know, where are you from? Because I'm a, I was an international student. I said, Turkey, oh, are you a reformist? I was like, what is the purpose of this question? Because they're expecting, because of the prejudice and the stereotypes, they're expecting more like, you know, like maybe like totally covered and maybe like submissive, you know, like oppressed or whatever, you know, they have some picture in their mind and it's really hard for you to just break it. And I asked, I don't know what the purpose of this question, but you know, like the country that I'm coming from, luckily, you know, like has a little bit different perspective from other Middle Eastern countries. And Dr. Toyde has experience of Iran, which sometimes we debate each other about comparing and contrasting Iranian and Turkish feminist movements. And um, I'm lucky that I just get the heritage from um, women's movement in Turkey, because you know, right now, especially the recent government that right now I'm working on is, you know, like totally covering the women's rights and also, you know, like based on, you know, domestic violence and also rights about both two seg segments in the Turkish society, like extra, extra, you know, instead of too much secular, you know, they just want to just get the headscarf women into the politics or they want to just give a little bit more rights to headscarf citizens as well. But right now, you know, things are a bit changing and I'm experiencing that the youth in the Middle East is, uh, in, especially in Turkey, you know, experience, experiencing more like progressive and more dedicated to human rights instead of just only uh, women rights. 
And, so. and I noticed, well, something I think was really important to talk about is maybe you could explain to our viewers as far as which countries in the Middle East do women have a lot of power and which countries do they not. So, for example, in Turkey, they have a great deal yeah. of, of a power, but maybe not so much in Iran. And maybe you could outline for us, just break right. the Middle East down a bit for us. Yeah, exactly. It's important to decipher this whole, you know, uh, notion of the Middle East or Muslim women. It, as if, you know, if somebody asks you, how do women do in the Christian world or in the Western world? It's such a diverse society, you know, entity. The uh, Western world is divided into different countries, different cultures, different histories, and different legal systems, right? And different political systems. So in the Middle East, the same. Uh, uh, let me mention, uh, when we say that, we don't want to, we don't, we want people to go beyond these negative and simplistic stereotypes. At least I don't want to imply that there aren't, that there aren't problems. Uh, there are actually serious problems and lagging in, in terms of women's rights in many parts of the Middle East. In some parts they are doing better, in some parts they are still have a long, long way to go. For example, in Turkey, as uh, Fatma mentioned, it has been kind of in forefront of reform and uh, secularization of the law. By secularization here, I mean to make law separate from religion and, and have a democratic state that doesn't mingle religion with uh, state and also tries to update laws and um, reform the legal system, including the uh, personal status law, which pertains to family law and so forth, uh, more compatible with the new changes, with realities, with modern times. Turkey has succeeded a lot in that. So has Tunisia. Tunisia has been also a very good model, when, especially it comes to the women's rights and women's empowerment. Um, recent, in recent years, Algeria, Morocco have done some reforms uh, that have, uh, have been considerable in terms of improving women's status in the family, within marriage. For example, women are now able to transfer nationality and citizenship to their children born uh, from uh, foreign husbands and even transfer nationality to their husbands. They don't have to now have the permission of their husbands in order to work outside home, which wasn't the case in some of. The problem is that in these societies, uh, we have three, three barriers to women's rights. One is just the social customs, very traditionalist, you know, um, kind of deeply ingrained uh, sexist attitudes, which have been rampant in also Western cultures, uh, say it's 50, years ago. It, it has improved now to, to some extent. Uh, but this, there are lots of still conservatism, given that many of these societies are in transition from rural agrarian societies into modern industrialized societies. So that is one thing, the cultural, the, the old traditional patriarchal, patrimonial relationship and attitudes. The other barrier is the law. The law in most part of the uh, MENA, meaning Middle East and North African countries, especially those laws that pertain to women's status, personal status law, um, have been based on the Sharia, that is the Islamic uh, oh. fiqh and right. construction of the law. And the, the patriarchy, the ruling patriarchy the, and the clerical authority within Islamic tradition has tried to, to pretend or argue that this Sharia is a sacred law, a uh, word of God, and if they, for example, according to that, men have the right to polygamy, to marry one wife up to four wives, in, in the Shia tradition versus Sunni, they can even have temporary wives, mechanism of muta or uh, siqa, which is, you know, temporary yeah. marriage from and is that an hour to nine years. Is that in the, is that Quranic None of this, no. doctrine or no. is? No, temporary marriage is not in the Quran. 
And what many is of the Quranic doctrine with relation to women in their rights and their roles? Is well, it? it's we cannot, uh, you know, really summarize that uh, in in just half an mm. hour. But what I can say that within the Quran, men and women are created from the same essence. The story of creation that we know in the Bible, in the Old Testament and New Testament, doesn't appear in the Quran. Mm. So both men and women are created from the same essence. They are not that women have been created from the spare rib of uh, Adam, you know, so the story of Eve and creation is not in the Quran. Although there are in the Hadith and other uh, scriptures that are not necessarily accepted by all Muslims. But in the Quran, which is the center, the, what converge all Muslims together, and by many Muslims is considered the word of God, mm -hmm. there is no such a thing. Men and women are equal in the eye of God. But when it comes to the worldly matters, division of labor, division of power within the family, there are verses in the Quran that are not egalitarian. Mm -hmm. the, the egalitarian ethics of the Quran, which considers everybody equal in the eyes of God, and God favors everybody based on virtue and you know good deeds rather than racial differences or gender differences. But in, uh, in worldly life, in managing your daily life, there are some verses in the Quran that need to be uh, updated, in other words, reinterpreted. And that is the ref what reform Islam is doing, like in, a, like in Christianity, in Judaism. You know, there are verses that one, if you read it nowadays, you, you feel embarrassed that this is part of your religion. Mm -hmm. But we have kind of put those aside in Christianity, in reform Judaism. So reform Muslims and modern, more modernist Muslims and Muslim feminists especially, are trying to reinterpret and reconstruct parts of those um, ideas in the Quran that w were actually applicable to 1400 years ago uh, to the uh, Arab culture and Arab society of that time, mm. not, not even today. Not today. Right. Fatma, you were telling me earlier about um, one of the figures of, um, of Islam, the female figures that could really be sort of a feminist model in a way. Yeah, I, I don't want to call it a feminist figure, but you know, like, to be honest, you know, like, it's the um, wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, his Hatija, and you know, like, when it, I just grow up in a family, which I'm really a religious grandma, and you know, like, I live, like, long talks after the dinners and whatever, so you know, like, what I learned from her is, like, be like a Hatija, it's, it's, a, it's like an honor, you know, do you know what I mean? Because, you know, Hatija is for me like a businesswoman is the first businesswoman and then the second you know the you know like the first woman who just give the proposal to prophet muhammad a marriage mm -hmm. proposal which is like so so extremely like you know like radical though in those periods you were talking about years and years and years ago which is too radical in those periods because islam was not appearing in those years and so she is a businesswoman which is like she's so rich and she has a lot of opportunities to just stay you know wealthy and then you know like rich life, but she preferred to struggle with Prophet Muhammad. And also she is an activist, which I, which I observed because, you know, she never, during the, you know, like, um, ex, you know, expansion of the Islamic, you know, knowledge that that's coming from God, which I believe, and she just stay with Prophet Muhammad. And then, you know, like, she just be a female figure. And then also her ideas was taken from Prophet Muhammad. I was reading a book about Hatija. It's called, um, the desert and the sea, which is like controversial. It means like one part there's a desert and one part there's a sea. So Hatija is like at the middle of it. So one, t one part it's wealthy life and the other part is just desert. But she stayed with the Prophet Muhammad. And then, you know, she just, she's the person who is, whose ideas was taken from a lot of male um, leaders in those periods, you know, and prophet, one of the leader of a religion, is getting the ideas of female, which is a bit like radical. Think about patriarchy in nowadays parliaments, and then you know, like think about the m members in the parliaments in recent democracies and the numbers of the women in the parliament. So, 
Uh, Let me also add to mm -hmm. what Fatma said that Khadija was 20 years senior to Muhammad. Yeah. Oh. When when she married Muhammad, she proposed the marriage. She proposed him. She actually initially she had hired Muhammad to take care of her, to manage her business, to be the one who uh, would take care of the caravans and camels for the trade. And then she proposes marriage to him. And also in the con in marriage contract, one of the conditions she makes is that you, sh you cannot marry at any other woman. Because polygamy existed prior to is uh, emergence of Islam in the you know, Arab Peninsula and in many other parts of the region. Right. Uh, so she, uh, Muhammad stays with this woman who was 20 years older than him, and he was only 25 years old when he marries her. And they stay together for how much? Tw 20 years or 20 so? 20 years old. Yeah. Until Khadija dies, and he, he doesn't marry anyone else. So the interesting thing is that many Muslims do not, unfortunately, do not use Khadija as a role model. I was exactly. going to say it's... And they don't well, talk about why it. Why has it, if, if that's the model, then where has where did because, it go wrong? Because that's not because at all patriarchy, how it's practiced in so many countries. Yeah, because religion has been constructed, especially fiqh, the jurisprudence of Islam, has been constructed by male clerics. The clergy, all these ulama, mm -hmm. so-called Islamic ulama, have been uh, protectors of patriarchy in, 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 a, in the greater extent of, of being protector of spirituality. So they have constructed religion compatible to the existing and uh, growing patriarchy within the region. Mm -hmm. And especially the, the question of veil came out later to emulate the uh, you know, upper class women of the harem of the kings and those countries right. that Islamic, new Islamic uh, uh, supporters conquered. So there are, it's really an, uh, an interesting history that how uh, people today can choose selectively. Those who want yeah. to reinforce patriarchy choose only those parts that can be compatible with reinforcing male dominance. And there are now, fortunately, more educated women, uh, more you know, growing feminist movement okay. in the uh, Muslim world that are trying to uh, kind of take back this monopoly of construction of religion and understanding of religion. And also, I want to emphasize that we should not uh, reduce uh, women's status in, in the whole region to religion only. Mm. We cannot explain, uh, right, everything exactly. based uh, or attribute all the problems. For example, one of the major problems is still many in many countries women are dealing with is question the problem of violence, mm -hmm. gender-based violence, like honor killing, wife domestic uh, bad, violence, domestic violence. Um, also mobbing, especially harassment. honor crimes, which are very... Like bride burning, this kind of thing? Bride or? burning doesn't exist in... in bride burning uh, hap, used to happen in uh, parts of India because of the dowry issue. Uh, but there are self-emulation for some women who just get no help, uh, with right. no protection by the legal system or government system. So this, the, this problem of violence and the problem of the law, which is still based on a very patriarchal, uh, you know, fiqh uh, jurisprudence, are the challenges that women are fighting. And uh, as I said, in some countries like Tunisia, I uh, Iraq, before uh, we invaded Iraq, by the way, Iraq used to have actually more progressive laws. Mm -hmm. uh, there were lots of professional women in Iraq. Unfortunately, Iraq has been regressing with respect to women's rights rather than progressing. Mm -hmm. um, but in countries like um, Morocco, as I said, Algeria, recently some reforms in Jordan uh, have been taking place, some reforms in Egypt. But countries like Yemen, uh, Iran, Iran has regressed in terms of legal rights of women and access to justice, to the courts and all that. Uh, especially with regard to marriage, polygamy, uh, divorce, uh, guardianship of children, have all regressed after the uh, 1979 revolution. But fortunately, in all these countries, there are growing feminist movements.
are and, trying and to And one try. of the things I wanted to um, to show is there's, um, I spoke with a professor in Cairo, her name's a, a mm -hmm. Professor Amani Ismail, and she's been watching on the ground these feminist movements, these women g with taking the power back and uh, really getting active in the streets. So it, I, let's show that video now. And, I, and as you as you see all of the different sort of the, the activities in the streets and so, uh, women are, are as active as the men, I, I imagine, in the in all the protests that happened. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can't even begin to tell you, Mandy. I mean, they're they're so visible. I mean, y you know, if you exclude all the women from the protests, they would be uh, there would have been a lot less of a threat to the regime. I mean, seriously, I'm not just saying that because I'm female. But you, you see them, you know, on the streets demonstrating, you see them on, you know, TV footage, images uh, demonstrating. I mean, it's really um, refreshing. And, uh, you know, their role in this revolution has been really undeniable and undenied. And is that that's different than other, than previous years? Or do you feel like in some ways, when you look back, that women were, uh. are sort of finding uh, their place in it all? Or are women sort of more active? Is that increasing? Um, it's definitely increasing because with the now, you know, you really equal access to a lot of the, you know, of course, you know, education and more open mindedness about, you know, women's access to education. And that's that's been in place for a while. So that has been, of course, uh, accompanied by open mindedness and their participation and everything else. Uh, she mentions that education is one of the major influences as to maybe why women have chosen now to really make their themselves known i wondered if there are if that's something that you would agree with or are there other reasons you think that this is that this is the moment that they've seized yeah one of the areas that women have made uh, really impressive progress uh, not only in the middle east in most parts of the world has been in educational attainment uh, in many universities in many uh, re countries of the Middle East, women make up uh, the majority of student enrollment, like in the United States. Look at CSUN. Right. Students, uh, female students outnumber male students. And so it's not only at the just primary and secondary level and literacy, but even in tertiary level, women are doing very well. So that itself has been a big shift in the Middle East that empowered women. Now women are knowledgeable not only about, uh, you know, knowledge is empowering, about science, about they can now have better access to employment. They have done also better, in, there are considerable patterns of impro improvement in employment uh, in some countries better than others, like in Turkey. Like in Turkey. The percentage of women in uh, workforce is higher than, say, in Iran much higher than in Yemen mm -hmm. or in Saudi Arabia. In Tunisia, is also very high. In some countries, higher than others. Uh, but on average, still, employment rate is low. Um, it's 28% on average, if you, you know, the combine, total, combine. total uh, Middle East and uh, North Africa. In some places, it's more than 40%. In some places, it is 12%, like in formal economy. So that is another area, econ economic improvement. The other improvement we have seen, which is connected to this uh, education, is health. Women's health status has improved. There is um, decreasing rates in fertility, mm -hmm. because the, le the less women are busy giving birth and taking care they of children, children, the more time they have to, to have other um, occupations outside home and get active in social arena. Uh, so that health and reproductive rights, access to contraceptives have helped. And all this has helped also to, uh, to increase women's participation in politics. Right. There is now a growing trend in women's, uh, so including in, in revolutionary movements like we right. see in Egypt. And I wonder Tunisia. too, yeah, and also in Turkey as well, you know, Turkey we are just increasing, um, you know, member parliaments in um, Turkey as well, because mm -hmm. right now it's like 50 out of 550 and 30 of them is from the Justice and Development Party. And then wow. it's expected and that's in the ne next elections it's expected it's going to be doubled maybe. Mm -hmm. So it's like huge difference. And also I want to add something, including education and health. I think social media is totally um. like affecting it, you know, 
like mm -hmm. think what happened in the revolution, like Twitter, Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, all those kind of stuff. They were just yeah. in the revolution as well. So these really like gather all the women perspectives yeah. within the social media and the mainstream in, in the uh, revolution, which the is really important. globalization, yeah. you know, whole globalization. new uh, communication technology has been a big big impact uh, and demographic changes, more urbanization. No borders. You know, and no border, <laughs> yeah, right. the, border. the global village global is village. really, and women are also learning about uh, global feminism, about human rights discourse, democracy discourse, and that's affecting everybody. Well, and many people are saying there's really no going back at this point. And no, so yeah. and no as way. we sort of, just to wrap up, I wondered if you could both speak to, you know, maybe not that anyone can see the future, but mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Uh, what 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 is next as far as this contagious f uh, feeling that there is in the Middle East that women across that that part of the world are feeling mm -hmm. their power? And we were talking earlier about even like in Iran next mm -hmm. week, you were helping to organize um, a protest. A protest on the occasion of the International Women's Day on March 8. Uh, you know, international women are celebrating. This year it is the uh, hundredth year of the. A centennial of the International Women's Day that everywhere women are celebrating their achievements and in those er countries like Iran that uh, still the government's the lack of democracy uh, represses any public uh, demonstrations. People are expecting a lot of, you know, uh, suppression, repression and attacks on these demonstrations. But while I'm very optimistic and the, the prospect is very hopeful, but I, I want also just within our celebration of all these achievements, I want to be cautious that there are still a lot of challenges, poverty, unemployment, and also threat of uh, backlashes, the, the Islamism, that is extremist, you know, fundamentalism, uh, is, is a serious challenge in some countries, more so than others. Um, so I'm hoping that, for example, in Egypt, uh, women's group came together, uh, more than 100 NGOs, and there is a center, um, Egyptian Center for Women's Rights, that they have issued a statement saying that the new constitutional committee has uh, not included even one single woman in the revision of and reformation of the constitution. That is very alarming. That is very important. So we need to remain vigilant. These, some of the rights that we have gained throughout all these years in Turkey, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Morocco, in to some level in much less uh, in Iran, they're, they all can be taken away. And if we want to progress, we need to uh, be careful not to be dominated again by extremism, by wars and conflicts, because these can make the situation worse. It's encouraging to hear how much is going on, you know, in, in Turkey and in and Iran and how everyone, this contagious factor is really mm -hmm. happening. And I want to thank you so much both for being well, here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. for sharing your thoughts with us. I'm Andy Gosling, and thank you for watching On Point. She talked about a constitution, and we just recently, in 2010, just had a constitution referendum. So it's no way back, you know, like, they just vote, and then the majority of the people say, yes, we have to just change the constitution, which is really good because the new government is trying to just regulate and then change the um, like militaristic constitution in Turkey right now. So it's, it means like more women li women's rights, more women's rights in the total.